So this is a testimony on my job that I started. I started last year, March, um, which was also the time that I started first coming to church. Mm. Um, and since I've been at work, I have been meeting people, um, lots of people that don't believe in God, um, and lots of people that are into spirituality, like I was. And I've been having conversations with people, and they've been challenging me with the questions that I also had when I was in spirituality. Like, for instance, um, I was having a conversation, I was, um, I work in probation so I, with a group of criminals, and I had yeah. six of them, and they were all atheists. And they were just challenging me, no, God is not real, how could God be real? Um, they were talking about what they've been through in life, and if God was real, he would have helped them and saved them. Um, a lot of them have been through a lot of trauma, and they were saying that's why they were where they are now yeah. in community service. Um, and um, yeah, so he was saying there is no God, and he was talking about science a lot. Yeah. And I noticed when I started to read my Bible and I started to come to church, I realized what the deception was with it, within spirituality. It's like it had taken the Bible and yeah. manipulated it, if that makes sense. So when they were talking about science, they were like, yeah, like everything's a, uh, a frequency and everything has a molecule. And I'm like, yes, and listen to this. Yeah. And I'm like, think about it. God created the world and he spoke it yes. into existence. Yeah. Yeah let there be like that yeah. so i was relating the bible to what i could understand from yeah. what i do you know because i've read spirituality yeah. in books so it's like the reason why they like science can back up you know yeah. that this yeah. frequency is because god spoke everything right. into existence. Yeah. vibrations Come in on. every word we say yeah. so it's like i've been having conversations and i'm able to speak to them about because I already know what they're going to say yeah. in regards to spirituality, and now I've been reading my Bible, I'm able to tell them, but look. Mm-hmm. So I've been yes. having conversations with people, and one of the first guys that, um, one of the first group of guys that I had, he finished, he had like 300 hours, and when he was on his hours, he was basically, his friend betrayed him, whilst he, that's wow. the reason why he was there. His friend done fraud on his account, ran off with the money, and he's now doing 300 hours for the friend, and he wow. trusted the friend, and you know when he was homeless the friend that they move in with um with her so he was really hurt and he kept just telling me like he feels to get revenge and he feels and this is the time that god was speaking to me about past betrayals um, and forgiving people Um, and if i don't forgive people how could god forgive me as well as he's forgiven and it's like everything that god was telling me about forgiveness and about betrayal i was able to basically talk to this guy about yeah. um, and I was just having conversations about, with him and <coughs> show, telling him what I learned and how I felt and you know that I could relate to his feelings of the hurt and stuff and I was just telling him and then yeah so when he finished he actually came back to visit and was just like thank you for your encouraging word and everything so I feel like God has placed me there for a reason yeah. and I'm able to Amen. tell others about Christ. Good testimony. Uh, amen. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 12, verse 24 to 25. John 12, 24 to 25. And there was a book that I read, I think I mentioned it actually in a sermon about a man named Justin uh, Lacombe. He was a, um, a very wealthy man. He had uh, a, a beautiful wife, three sons, a big house, a Porsche, a Mercedes. And um, after many years of success, he found himself in a very difficult situation where he had squandered uh, three quarters of a million pounds in gambling debt. And uh, what had happened was uh, he just found himself gambling his, his life away. And eventually he used his company credit card to again gamble his life away. Um, and it was he was prosecuted. Many different things had happened. He consider, or he, he commit, he tried to commit suicide a number of times. And he writes this book, and, and the book is is literally a uh, a help to people that are stuck, not just stuck in, in gambling, not just stuck in in addiction, some sort of addiction in terms of gambling, but just stuck in life. Stuck to, so that they can try and find hope, so that they can try and find some sort of restoration. This man, he, he brings the aspects of, of God into this, into this situation and says that it was a miracle that I am here today. It's a miracle that I've been healed 
from my habit, from this addiction that was overtaking my life. And as I'm, I'm pondering on this book, it made me think about something that I watched recently about a man named Carl Lentz. He was the, uh, the pastor of uh, Hillsongs. Hillsongs is um, a famous church group. So he's the pastor of this church group. And only recently he comes out in these interviews and he's spoken about uh, his past failures. Uh, basically what happened was he ended up getting sacked or getting kicked out of Hillsong because he committed adultery. And uh, he says to him, well he says in this interview, he says, you know, I, I thank God that I was caught at the time that I was caught because I had, a, I had an issue. He says, I had a problem, there was something that I was dealing with that I, I didn't even realize. And the deeper issue is that I had an insecurity. And because of my insecurities, it leaked out and it made me do things that were very uncharacter-like. Mm -hmm. And that can be the same thing for us as well, church, is that we could do certain things, and it's not because it's our character, but it's because there's a deeper, a deeper issue that's happening. It's because there are certain things that we're trying to deal with, or certain things that we're trying to push to the side. But because of our deeper issues, we're saying to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to play out in this area of my life. I'm going to end up doing this. I'm going to end up doing that. What happens to this man named Carl Lentz is that he ends up losing almost everything for him to realize that I've got an issue. For him to, to realize that, hey, you know what, I, I, I've, I need to build this genuine relationship with this man named Jesus that I preach about. There's an issue that needs to be dealt with. There's something that needs to happen there. A woman named Alex Morgan, she said, winning and losing isn't everything. Sometimes the journey is just as important as the outcome. Winning and losing isn't the, the most important thing here, but it's about understanding the journey that we're on. Understanding where, what direction we're going on in this journey. God, Jesus calls for us to join a journey, church. He calls for us to, to join a journey of bearing fruit. To join a journey so that we can observe the production of what's going to come forth from our lives question that I want to ask here today as we begin our sermon is that, hey, you know, what journey are you on? What journey are you on? <coughs> what journey are you on? Because the journey that Jesus desires for you is to bear fruit. And that's something that I want us to remember here today. If there's anything that I say uh, according to this message, it's that Jesus desires for us to bear fruit. We need to bear fruit. So I'll say that with me. We need to bear fruit. fruit. Exactly. Turn to your neighbor, say, We need to bear fruit. <laughs> we need to bear fruit. Amen. So, uh, John 12, if I can get a reader for me, please. If I can get someone to help me out. John 12, 24 to 25. Yes, I got. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Amen. Let's pray together, church. Father, I pray right now, Jesus, that you help us here today. God, uh, speak a word in season into our hearts. Lord, let us not leave the same way we came in. Jesus, I pray, God, that your words, oh God, will resonate, God, with uh, the, the situations of life. God, and I pray that you bring healing and restoration, God, into our lives and into our circumstances. Jesus, I thank you for your grace and your goodness. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 There is an uncomfortable reality in life. And that uncomfortable reality is that our world is heading in a direction that nobody likes, should I even say. Nobody likes the direction that our world is heading into. Nobody likes the leaders of our world today. Who likes Rishi Shunak? No, no one? No, okay. Alright, alright, cool. Uh, maybe, 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 I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm going somewhere there. Maybe I am going somewhere. Nobody likes the leaders of our world here today. 
Nobody likes the direction that we're going now. Nobody likes what's transpiring. The youth of today are, are copying or, 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 or doing exactly all the things that we say to ourselves. No, you guys shouldn't be doing this. Self-diagnosing themselves with multiple health issues. They're filling their brains with, with worries that they see and read about on the TV or, or news. Our world is filled with people that are, are cutting themselves because everybody else is doing it. Yeah. They're vaping and sucking up helium balloons because everybody yeah, else is doing it. They're drinking or smoking weed, sleeping around, jumping from relationship to relationship. Why? Because everybody else is doing it. Yeah. True. This is the uncomfortable reality of the world that we live in. It's that people don't understand the gift of life. They don't understand the gift of their own life. And, and people are, are lacking purpose and identity. Yeah. So rather than looking for purpose and identity in uh, God, what they do is they decide to themselves, you know what, let me just follow trends. Let me follow what everybody else is doing. Rather than thinking for myself, rather than looking at my life, rather than looking at the issues that I'm going through, I'm going to follow what everybody else is doing. One of the biggest things that's trending at the moment is this idea of relevancy. I, I need to be relevant. Many people have, have a deep worry, and the worry is, hey, you know what, my life needs to matter. I want some sort of impact in this world, which leads to the thought of, I need to be remembered. I need to be remembered five generations down the line. I need to be remembered uh, 10 or 100 years later, when after I pass away, everyone needs to remember what I've done and who I am. It's crazy, as I'm thinking about this uncomfortable reality of life, there, there's a reason why we today even speak about people like Moses and Abraham and Joseph and David. Thousands of years after they pass away, why do we speak about these men? Why do we speak about men that were born or men that died thousands of years before even Jesus came onto the scene? Here we find it in our text actually. In John 12, 25, it says, He who loves his life will lose it. And these people, they gave priority to the things of God. They loved their life, but they said to themselves, you know what, I'm not going to hold on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lose my life and give priority to God. I'm going to make God the center. And as I allow him to be the center of my life, that's when my life will count. That's when there will be relevancy to my life and all that I've done on this earth. That's why we speak about these men, because these men were set. They allowed God to be central. To their life. They allowed God to be priority in their life. And Jesus here in our text in verse 24, he's presenting a, a very profound paradox, which is a, again also an uncomfortable reality. And it says, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And the reason why I say it's an uncomfortable reality is because at this moment that Jesus says this statement, he's in the middle of his ministry. And things are happening, people are following him, people are learning, people are changing. And then he drops this bombshell. Many people didn't understand what he was trying to say, but there were some people that did. Some people understood that he's speaking about his death here. He's speaking about a time that's to come where he's going to die and much fruit will be produced. Where people will begin to see. Where people's eyes will begin to open. Where things will begin to transpire. Further than what's happening at this very moment in time. There were people, loads of people, thousands of people that followed him. But yet he says, when I die, it's going to produce much grain. When I die, there's going to be so much more that's going to happen. Imagine people that are there that understood this statement. So your death is going to bring life. How, how does that even make sense? But Jesus, that doesn't make sense. How can you die and help us? 
How is it possible? How can you die and produce anything good that's going to happen in our life? Isaiah 53, 10, it says, Yet yeah, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put to him grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall uh, prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This is a, a, a prophecy that's spoken thousands of years, or hundreds of years, should I even say, before Jesus and it's about Jesus. And it's speaking about when he dies, much fruit is going to come from this. When he dies, people are going to realize, people are going to be justified, people are going to understand what or the reason or the purpose of why he's gone through so much suffering. People understand what's going to happen here. If, he, if, if they could understand, should I even say, what's going to happen here? Then those questions wouldn't come about. Jesus wouldn't need to continue to reiterate, hey, this is going to happen, and when it happens, fruit's going to be produced. But Jesus needed to constantly remind them that, hey, you know what? When I pass away, something good is going to come with this. This is a paradox, or this is a very confusing thing, because when things are bad, it doesn't mean things are good. When things have gone wrong, it doesn't mean things are going to be okay. But Jesus says, hey, you know what, when it looks horrible, when it looks like things are bad, things are going to be good. Good things are going to come from this. And this statement that Jesus produces is the ultimate a statement of sacrifice. It's the ultimate understanding that, hey, you know, our world tells us we've got to withhold for us to gain. It's logical sense for us to withhold. It's logical sense for us to not give because we're not going to uh, accumulate more if we give. But hey, Jesus says, if we sacrifice, that's when we'll end up on top. That's the paradox that he's bringing. He's helping us to understand that if we withhold, then we're not going to produce. If we say to ourselves, God, I need to think about my own life. God, I need to think about the, the possessions that I have. How are you going to bear fruit? You're constantly thinking. Because God desires for us to bear fruit. He needs, we need, should I even say, yeah. to bear fruit. See, to be fruitful means to live a life that produces good things. It's a, a reflection of the character of Christ. It's a great testimony that, that Frankie had, had said. You know, yeah. It's a reflection of the character of Christ. Yeah. That you can show patience in different scenarios of your life. That you can show mercy and grace in different scenarios of your life. It's to produce something that's good. Fruitless Christian is a contradiction. It's a, an indication that something abnormal, abnormal, should I even say, is going on. Something that shouldn't be happening is happening. When you say to yourself, there's no fruit in my life, that means something is going wrong here. That means something is not quite right. Just as the grain of wheat must die to produce a fruitful harvest. We must be willing to say to ourselves, I'm going to put aside my selfish ambition. I'm going to put aside my desires. I'm going to put aside the things that I've attached myself to in this world. Put aside the good experiences that I, that I desire to chase after. And I'm going to put in priority the kingdom of God. The uncomfortable reality of letting go of dreams and putting things to the side that we've heavily invested into. I remember when uh, I got saved uh, and uh, I was trying to witness to a group of my friends. Uh, and I sat down with, with one of my guys and I'm sitting down with him and, and he's someone that I always used to go raving with. Always used to go clubbing with. So I'm sitting down and I'm telling you, yeah, I'm saved now. No, I will, no longer am I going to come out with you anymore. He sits down, he pauses, and he's listening to me 
witnessing to him. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, he's getting it, he's getting it, he's understanding what I'm saying. And he says, so, like, you're not going to come, like, drink cups with me anymore. And I'm just thinking, like, I've said all of this, and the only thing that you've come up with, the conclusion that you've got, you're not going to come drink cups with me. Are we not friends? <laughs> and then he's reading off different things, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that, we're not going to... And then I said to him, you know what? You know, honestly, I'm okay with the things that I'm not going to do anymore. I, I, genuinely, when, when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't think to myself, oh, I'm going to miss out on these different things. I didn't think to myself, hey, you know what? I, I wish I could go to here. I wish I could go to there. My genuine thought was, you know, I don't have to put myself in situations anymore just to please everybody else. Yeah. I don't have to do any anything crazy anymore just so that I can be with the crowd. Yeah. I can actually just be myself and be content with just being myself. Realize that I made a decision to just let go. Didn't have to hold on anymore. And just looking back on it now, the stuff that I've ended up letting go, I'm actually grateful because God has provided, he's given me so much more. He's given me so much more. He's given me a wife like Christina. Hey! <laughs> so much more. But I, I, could have been, I could have been doing X, Y, and Z. I could have been doing all these different things. But I'm happy now that I've got a, some sense of security, some sense of stab stab stability. Yeah. Stability, that's the word that I'm looking for. <laughs> and it doesn't come close. So it's even just what we saw on Wednesday, seeing the men preaching, yeah. you know, seeing men that are being transformed, being encouraged by, by seeing things that God is doing in our church here today. Yeah. Doesn't come close. If we continue to hold on to the things that we say to ourselves, you know, I need this in my life. It's going to end up ruining what God wants to give to us. Hearing testimonies of how faithful God has been, decisions that people have made, things that have happened, it's going to end up ruining what God wants to give to us. We might say to ourselves, you know, if I give my life to Jesus, then I'm in a losing position. But no, God says, you're going to gain life. When you give, you're going to gain it. When you lose, you're going to, you, you love your life simply because you want to lose it. He elaborates what he says in verse 24 and in verse 25. He says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And here he's, he's elaborating just the winning formula. A formula on how we can win in life, church. On how we can understand what Jesus wants for our life. On how we can uh, dive into the plans that he desires. On how we can get this concept of winning into our lives. Because it's not just in regards to us holding on. It's not just in regards to us uh, prioritizing and feeling comfortable and feeling that, hey, you know what, I'm missing out on pleasures and, I want, and, and I've got all these different ambitions and I'm going to chase after it. No, all Jesus desires for our lives is to prioritize the kingdom of God. And as we do so, we begin to start realizing that the, the things that this world has to offer, it, can, it cannot compare to what Jesus has to offer. Jesus is not just calling people to salvation as he says this, but he's calling people to discipleship. Yeah. Discipleship will cost. Billy Graham, a famous uh, Christian preacher, he said, salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. Salvation is free. The gift that God wants to give to you, yes, it's free. But to be a disciple it costs so much more. It's going to cost you sometimes even your household. Matthew 10, 37, 38, it says, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me 
is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. It's got, it can cost the household. Discipleship can cost security as well. Matthew 8.20, it says, that, And Jesus said to him, Foxes uh, have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Just think about that. The security of just being at home. The security of just laying down your head on your pillow. Just imagine if that just disappeared. Jesus says this is what discipleship costs. Discipleship can also cost friendships. 2 Timothy 4.16 it says, At my first defense no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Here Paul is... He's gone out and he's gone to preach the gospel. And as he's been arrested, his friends disappeared. Discipleship can cost so many things. It can cost things that we're not anticipating that it can cost. Things that we might say to ourselves, this is where I find my peace and this is where I find my security. But discipleship can cost and it can be taken away. Doesn't mean a, a, a literal hatred for life as Jesus was speaking in verse 25. But it, it's an understanding, it's a, a recognition of our true purpose. It's an understanding of uh, us chasing after fulfillment and not just trying to chase after the latest trend. It's not just about following our friends or the people that we hang around with. But it's about chasing after the desire or the plan that God has for our life. Because if we lose, then we can win. Jesus is making a call to discipleship here. He's saying that things can be lost. Things uh, might not go according to plan. It's not going to go the way that we desire it to go. But just put your trust in him. As I'm thinking about this concept of discipleship, I, I, I had five things that came to, to narrow down the best way of uh, uh, entailing what discipleship is about. Uh, the first thing that came to mind for me is sometimes listening and doing uh, things that you, might, you may find hard to do. Sometimes listening and doing things that you may find hard to do. Matthew 26, 39, it says, He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass from you. Doing things that you may not say to yourself, you know, I want to do this. Mm. Jesus was, per he's a perfect example, but he was instructed, he's been uh, encouraged, he he's, he's been given the layout, he's been given the plan. And yet when it comes to the moment of now fulfilling this plan, he says, ah, oh, don't really feel like doing this. Moments where sometimes on a Saturday night I say to myself, hey, you know what, I don't really feel like preaching tomorrow. I'm just being, I'm just trying to be real. Yeah. <laughs> don't really feel like even coming to church. Yeah. But discipleship is about doing things yeah. You may find hard to do. Second thing is leaving things behind and getting involved. It's about losing your identity and picking up another one. Uh, Matthew 4, 20, it says that they immediately left their nets and followed him. And then the next scripture, Matthew 9, 9, it says that Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. These men, as they left what they were doing, they picked up a new identity. They, they dropped the nets. They dropped the, the tax booth. And they said to themselves, I'm going to pick up a new identity in Jesus. No one knows Matthew to just be uh, the tax collector now. Matthew is a disciple or a follower of Christ. No one knows Peter to just be a fisherman they know him now as a disciple of Christ. It's 
but losing the identity that you walked into this place with, picking up a new identity. Picking up an identity that says, hey, this person is a follower of Jesus. It's about getting involved. It's about following after. It's about doing more than just being. Doing more than just hearing the words. It's about following after Jesus. Third thing is putting Jesus first in all things. Uh, Mark 10, 21, it says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You will have treasures in heaven and come and take up your cross and follow me. Here he's speaking to the rich young ruler. And he's trying to help the rich young ruler understand that hey, there's more to life than just following and obeying the rules that have been set in front of you. There's more to life than just living life by the book. And you know what? The crazy thing about this story is not many of the Gospels mention stories more than once. But this story was mentioned in three different Gospels. This story was mentioned in three different books in the Bible. That's how we know that it had a powerful impact on the disciples here. Yeah. Because as they continue to mention it, they're probably in their mind trying to understand that he would give up Jesus just for money. It just doesn't make sense. But putting Jesus first is an intentional thing. It's a thought process. It's not just about saying to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to come to church aimlessly. But no, I'm going to purposely prioritize. I'm going to purposely prioritize Jesus in this part of my life. I'm going to purposely prioritize Jesus in waking up in the morning and making sure I give him glory. I'm going to purposely prioritize Jesus. When I go to sleep, I'm going to make sure that I give him praise. It's about being intentional. Putting Jesus first in everything that we do. That's what discipleship entails. Uh, the fourth thing, which I think is probably the second hardest thing, is using, using initiative. Using initiative, sometimes it could be the most difficult thing. It could be a, 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 a moment where you're trying to say to yourself, you know what, I don't want to step out of boundaries. I don't want to step out of line. I just want to stay in the barrier. I just want to stay and just make sure that things are okay. I just want to keep this relationship with Jesus as it has been. But using initiative is what discipleship is mainly about. When Jesus speaks to uh, his disciples and he's just about to ascend into heaven, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's no indication of how they're going to make disciples. All he tells them to do is just go. There's no indication of how he's gonna articulate, how they're gonna articulate, or how they're gonna speak, or how, how they're gonna pray. No, there's nothing like that. He told them to just go. Wow. And in the going, they use their initiative. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus has taught us okay. to, to pray. Okay. Jesus has taught us to, to, uh, to, to cast out demons, to, to, to heal the sick. Okay, this is what we're gonna do when we go. Yeah. What has Jesus taught us? Using initiative requires full thinking. It requires us to, to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a step of faith. Hey, I'm going to uh, apply action rather than just plan and strategize. I'm going to be bold in what I do. Because all that I've learned, all that I've taken in, all that I've seen, everything that I've read about, has worked, is working, and I'm going to make it work. And then the last thing is to create and operate in an atmosphere of dominion. See, dominion, first and foremost, is about aligning ourselves 
with God. It's about making sure that, hey, we're constantly seeking after his guidance and constantly making sure that we're in tune with his will. And as we begin to do this, we begin to start exercising authority. We begin to start exercising uh, the dominion that God, or, or yeah, that God has uh, desired for our lives. From the very beginning, when Adam was created, Adam was given dominion. But the only reason why we don't have dominion is because of sin. And now God has come in the flesh and he's come and he overtaken this, this thing called sin. And now all we have to do is put our trust in him. And he says, as we do so, we will now have Amen. Very simple. Oh, oh my, my mind is in all sorts of places. Oh, oh the thoughts in my mind are, are leaving me inactive. I, I can't necessarily do or carry out my daily activities because of things that's happening in my heart. If you were allowed the dominion to operate in your life, how have you cultivated the atmosphere of dominion in your life? Oh, I'm in a bad place. I'm going through a difficult situation. dominion yeah. operating in your life? Have you created even the atmosphere of dominion? Mm. That words that are spoken, thoughts that come into our minds, on. things that are happening around us, that we can say, no, I'm still going to be where I need right. to be, regardless of what's happening. No, I'm still going to go to outreach, even yeah. though the devil keeps lying to me and telling me I'm not saved. Good preaching. Mm. Come on. Dominion needs to be gotten. It, it needs to be created. It needs to be operated in. Colossians uh, 3, 23, it says, and whatever you do, do it uh, heartedly uh, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when we operate, even in the natural, if we operate in a spirit of excellence and integrity, we're, we're, we're allowing God's dominion to thrive in our lives. We're showing the character or the nature of God in how we operate in life and we're creating this atmosphere to thrive in our life. That when people will speak about us, other people will begin to defend us now. That's right. When people will start saying things, other people would back us up, even in the secret place. Yeah. When things start happening, hey, I've got receipts to say, hey, you know what? I have overcome this situation. Yeah. I don't live in the boundaries of the strongholds that I've walked into my relationship with Jesus because I have dominion in my life. That's right. Dominion begins to thrive when we create and when we start operating. But just as I close, I'm just going to quickly close with the greatest victory. You see, through Jesus' life, his sacrifice, through the loss of his life, the greatest victory of all time came about. We can say to ourselves, you know, how is it possible that this could be the greatest victory? And the reflection is, that fruit comes from it. You know, you've come from it. You've come because of the greatest victory. Something that happened thousands of years ago is now replicated. And it's allowed you to come and sit into, in a library uh -huh. and listen to a man like me. <laughs> See, true victory comes when we surrender when we begin to start realizing that my life can, cannot just be held at a point where I'm trying to accumulate, but I've got to let go. True victory comes 
when we begin to start realizing that Jesus' promises is how we can acquire dominion, how we can acquire the plan or, or the destiny that God has for us. Because that's what Jesus' promises are. His promises are us operating in all that's been spoken about. It's us stepping into all that's been spoken about. Jesus promises, hey, you know what? This is going to happen in your life. But hey, it's up to you how you want to fulfill it. It's up to you how you want to desire or to step into it. Greatest victory is us embracing this paradox of losing, but then still winning. I want to end with just four quick statements. Uh, and the first statement is embrace sacrifice. We've got to embrace sacrifice, church. We've got to embrace that there are going to be moments where God is going to to uh, toss and turn, where God is going to uh, require much more from us than, than what we're doing. And he's going to say to us, you're going to have to sacrifice somewhere. You're going to have to let go of something. This is where we've got to say to ourselves, you know, rather than wallowing in this, I've got to embrace it. Say thank you, God. Second thing is prioritize eternity. Just as I said earlier, we've got to focus on the eternal. Focusing on Jesus helps us to understand that investing in relationships, investing in all the fruits of the Spirit that God desires for us is only going to help us understand that life is, uh, or, or true investment in life can come from when we invest in people. Yeah, come on. When we invest in people, when we invest in people's needs, when we help people overcome, when we help or, or when we, we begin to start seeing people overcome, that brings true satisfaction yeah, to life. Yeah. And then the third thing is trust God's process. Trusting God's process, sometimes it doesn't look as clear as we might think it is. It doesn't look as, as uh, plain or, or understanding as we could think it is as well. But trusting in his process allows us to step into the boundaries that he can now begin to start moving. Where he can now begin to start operating and showing himself even more to us. You might have a great understanding and revelation of Jesus, but Jesus wants to give you more. He wants to show you more. And in showing you more, it's about stepping into the darkness. It's about stepping into a place where you have no understanding and no control of what's coming next. Yeah. And then lastly, it's to live life selfless, selflessly. Selflessly is understanding that as Jesus understood that my life is a sacrifice for others. As we begin to start understanding that your life is a sacrifice. That you give because you want to see someone else make it. That you do because you want to see other people make it. That you show love because you want to show the love, the sacrifice that Jesus has shown you. Fruit will begin to start happening. Fruit will begin to come. You know, this, this scripture says, you know, as we die, you know, that's when things will be produced. As you die, as you begin to start saying to yourself, well, I'm going to give rather than thinking or, or looking at myself in this circumstance, then God will begin to start blessing and adding and fruit will begin to come. We need to bear fruit. Yeah. Amen. With that, can everybody head bows? Amen.